I'm going to tell you a little bit about Enjoy Life Foods so you know who we are. Uh, before I do that, um, if you want to tweet about me, my handle is Enjoy Life CMO. I do uh, a lot of speaking at industry events, and some of the speaking events that I go to, they have screens on each side where they show the live Twitter feed. And it's always fun because I'll look over my shoulder and it says, Enjoy Life, C Enjoy Life CMO sucks. This is really boring. And, um, <laughs> And then I still have to finish the whole talk. So uh, that's not happening here. Um, so you can say whatever you want. I won't read it until tonight. Um, and then if you want to link in with me, uh, it's Joel Wardy. Um, don't ask me why the second A is there. Someone put it there, and it's just pronounced Wardy. So let me tell you a little bit about Enjoy Life Foods so you know where we are. We are a $45 million food company. So in the grand scheme of things, we are a relatively small company when you think of all the big companies that are out there. And our specialty is, is that we're in the gluten-free, allergy-friendly space. So if you're like me, there, you read a lot about gluten-free and it's becoming kind of boring, right? We're tired of hearing about gluten-free. It's in the press all the time. Here's some um, stats that I will share with you and I'm just going to shift this slightly. There you go. Um, there are only 3 million people in the United States today that have celiac disease, and there's 22 million people who are eating gluten-free for other reasons. And so that's a total of 25 million. So if you think about that, for 25 million people, we're talking about gluten-free a little bit too much, and there's way too many brands. What we have always focused on at Enjoy Life is the additional 75 million people in North America who have food allergies and intolerances. So the market that we focus on is 100 million people. By the way, your food allergy gluten-free uh, lesson is going to end in three minutes. It's just to give you some background. So we are in what we call the free from market. And here's how we define free from. Free from is defined as gluten-free plus free from the top eight allergens. And the top eight allergens are egg, dairy, wheat, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. So those are the top eight allergens as designated by the FDA. Anyone here from Canada? So if you're from Canada, it's the priority 12. They have added mustard, sesame, sulfite, and gluten as an allergen in Canada, not in the United States. And if you're from Europe, they've added two more, lupin and celery. So we are free of all 14 allergens in our products. And then in addition, the other thing that's part of free from is all of our products are verified non-GMO. And I'm not going to get into the whole debate as to whether or not GMOs are good or bad. Last week it was fun because I was, on, I was uh, giving a talk at a food conference where the first speaker was from Monsanto and the second speaker was from ConAgra <laughs> and then Joel non-GMO came up. Um, so always enjoyable in those, this one, uh, although there may be people, I won't ask the question. But So all of our products are verified non-GMO. That's been true for about the last three years. And every new product that we develop will always be non-GMO. So that's our definition of free from. And our goal is to create this consumer devotion. Because here's what we know, especially in our category. If the consumer is devoted to us, they're going to buy more product because they believe and they trust in the brand. And in fact, what we're trying to achieve is what we call love marks. So here's takeaway number one, is what you want to do is to create love marks and trust marks for your brand. There's a great book that I recommend by Kevin Roberts, the CEO of Saatchi and & Saatchi, and it's called Love Marks. And basically what he says is, is that brands and companies own trademarks, consumers own love marks. Because the consumers are the ones who decide whether or not they're going to love your product. So what we believe is that we are the trust mark and love mark of choice of people that have food allergies and gluten intolerance. So back in January of, of 2011, um, we changed our whole marketing strategy. And one of the things that I, that I should state, and this is a good time to state it, is that everything that I show you today is exactly what we're doing. And by the way, I'm going to show you some things that we're doing wrong um, and that we can improve on because we're not perfect. And I'd be lying to tell you that I get all the credit. In fact, I get very little of the credit. The team that does this is all sitting right there in one, two, three, four. The fifth table, uh, Carolyn, Casey, and Katie, just hold your hands up so everyone can see them. So this is, this is our whole marketing team. It's the four of us. And I'm only there half time because I'm 
chief sales and marketing officer, so I spend my time on sales. So what you're going to see is it looks like we're doing all this stuff, which we are, and we're doing it with three and a half people. Um, so when we changed our consumer-centric strategy, what we decided to do was to put our consumer in the center, which you th might think, hey, that's just natural. But most people put their customer in the center, and here's how we differentiate it. Our customers are people like Whole Foods and Mariano's and Jewel, but our consumer who buys our product. So if there's retailers in the room, I'm going to say something that's a little bit, eh, it's a little bit negative. We are customer agnostic. What we're concerned about is our consumer. We want our consumer buying our product. Where they buy it from, that's up to the retailer. That's up to the retailer to offer some value-added service. What we'll do is we'll drive traffic to the store, but not necessarily your store. So when we created this, we put the consumer in the center, and then you can see that we build um, content around it, social loyalty, print and digital advertising, so digital path to purchase, which is what we're going to be talking about today, um, and then face-to-face -face experiential. So, you know, when, when people are talking about the third screen, and you hear a lot of people talking about the third screen, what we say is we have to totally change the way we're thinking about that. Because it's not about the third screen. It's what we call a one-screen world philosophy, which is the screen that's in front of you. So someone may start on their laptop and then move to their tablet and finish up on their Android or their iPhone. But companies that are thinking that they need to have a mobile strategy or a tablet strategy, they're thinking about it incorrectly. It's just digital. And here's the funny thing. So if you look around the room, you, you see kind of different groups of people. So you do have a few people who are my age. And when you have people my age, we think of digital as this thing. Then we've got a lot of people who I watched just right before I came up, and, and this isn't knocking anyone, but people were doing their Gmails, and people were tweeting, and people were, uh, one person was making reservations on open table, and you know, you're multitasking. So you're used to that. But the people today that are 15 year olds and 18 year olds, they're not even thinking, they're just living. And as marketers, those of us who are marketing, that's who we have to think about. We have to be thinking about those people who are just living a digital life every single day. And they're not thinking about going digital, and they're not thinking about what screen they're on. So we always focus on the screen that's in front of them, whatever it might be. And one of the things that we suggest is that you stop worrying about what you should be doing digitally and start worrying about what your consumers are doing. Focus on what they're doing and then change and, and change how you're doing it. So one of the things that we look at is we have a digital first posture, but not necessarily a digital first strategy, but a digital first posture. And we focus on that because that's the way we think we can reach people on their path to purchase. But here's another takeaway. It's a mantra that we've been using for, for years, which is think digitally, but act analog. So it's what we try and do all the time. Now here's the funny thing, right? This is a social media conference, and we're all sitting here analog. Why? And why isn't, is Hope in the room? Good. Why isn't someone periscoping this to everyone back at their office who didn't pay the fee? But they could, and it's going to happen. And if it's not happening, we have to worry about it. Why will people go to conferences? Now, they'll go to it for the interaction and the networking and all that, but the world is changing. And so this whole digital first posture, you have to offer that value added via digital. And if it's through path to purchase, you know, how, how is that going to be value added? So some quick statistics. 25% of search results of the world's top 20 brands end up on user generated content. So one of the things that we always say is, you know, we talk about these love marks and we, uh, these trademarks. So as a company, we own the trademarks. We don't own our brand. Who owns the brand? The consumers. They'll tell you what the brand means. The brand could be something completely different. And, and so if you think about it, that all of this content that users are generating, that's where searches are going. And that 25% figure continues to grow. Here's a really tough statistic. 
So 75% of all consumers polled say they don't trust what brands say in their advertising. Now think about your own life. You trust what other people say more than you trust what the brand says. And here's why this happens. In fact, 90% of all consumer decisions are due to a positive recommendation from someone that they trust. But here's the weird thing about someone that they trust. So think about the last time you bought something from Amazon. Is there anyone in this room who's never bought anything from Amazon? One, cool. Um, so I just got to tell you, is there anyone in the room who works for Amazon? All right, so I can tell you this. So Amazon is a, is a, is a customer of ours, and uh, my wife's in publishing, and um, my wife works for Hachette. And anyone who's following knows that Hachette and Amazon were in this war last year. So I wasn't allowed to talk about Amazon in the house because my wife was in war with Amazon, but Amazon's one of our big customers, and so boxes from Amazon would show up at our house because I buy from Amazon, and it just drove my wife Heidi crazy. And that has nothing to do with my talk today, but I just thought I'd share it. Um, so here's the interesting thing about this trust. Um, if you're buying something from Amazon, and you see three negative reviews, you won't buy it. And you don't know who those people are. But they're people. They're not brands. And so those three negative reviews stop you from trying that product. So it's weird how we'll trust strangers more than we trust entities that we know. Another example of that. So I fly a lot for, for business, and um, inevitably, I'll be in an airport, and I'll be sitting down in the seat, and someone will come up, and they'll have their backpack and their computer, and they'll put on the seat next to me, and then they'll say, excuse me, are you going to be here for a few minutes? Right? And I say, yeah. Will you watch this? Now, they don't know me, right? What if this is my scam? What if, right? What if I dress like this to sit in airports to steal computers? But why do people trust strangers more than they trust entities that they know? And it's just the weird thing that they do. So as a brand, we know this. And so we build platforms to allow people to share stories so that people will trust those stories. So three more sets of stats before we get on to showing you exactly what we're doing. 81% of consumers receive advice on a product purchase through social media. So it happens quite a bit. 77% of online shoppers use reviews to make a purchase decision. We just talked about that. And over 40% of companies use crowdsourcing to come up with new ideas. Now we do this quite a bit, so we'll ask people. Sometimes when we were working on packaging before, we put up a couple different uh, iterations of packaging and we ask consumers to give us feedback. Which one do you like better? Sometimes we'll ask, what products would you like to see us develop? We're introducing uh, five new products um, that are coming out actually next month, and those products, part of uh, the, uh, the reason we launched those products is it came up number one on a consumer survey when we asked them, you know, what would you like to see us develop? So, you know, crowdsourcing, not only is it a way to get new ideas, it's a way to engage. So you heard people earlier today and this morning talk about engaging with your consumers. Crowdsourcing is a great way to get people to engage, and we do it quite a bit. So Jeffrey Hazlett, who is the former CMO of Kodak, um, I wonder what year is going to happen when I have to start explaining what Kodak was. Um, but Jeffrey Hazlett, the former CMO of Kodak, once said, it's not about the eyeballs and ears, but it's about the hearts and minds. So a lot of people will ask, how many followers do we have? Here's what I'm going to tell you. Don't worry about it. What you want to worry about is, how engaged are they? How much are they becoming part of your brand? And that's really what's important. So I want to share how we're using uh, mobile um, as part of our strategy, starting with Pinterest. So the interesting thing about Pinterest is Pinterest is our lowest followed social platform, but it's one of the highest referrals to our website. And here's why. Because Pinterest isn't about how many people are following us. Pinterest is about how many people are sharing our story on their boards and how many people are following them. 
So this whole idea of, of consumer devotion, Pinterest lends itself really well to that. So um, as you can see with Pinterest, whether it's our site or our, some of our consumer sites, um, they will post different photos of, of different, this is, a, this is a consumer site who um, posts on Pinterest because she likes our products. She does a lot of different things with um, lunch boxes and uh, different people borrowing our, our photos, borrowing our content and posting on Pinterest. And we make sure that everything that we do is mobile optimized. So Pinterest is a big, uh, um, a, a big um, referral to our website and mostly to recipe pages. So we're gonna talk about recipes in a few minutes, but let's talk about Instagram. So Instagram, this is our Instagram account and when we took this, um, the screenshot, we were at 8,100, I think we're actually about 8,800 today. We were late to Instagram, and so we're playing catch up with Instagram. It's one of those things that I'll tell you, we weren't doing right, and uh, we're, we're doing much better. But I wanna share with you, um, you know, the strategies of how we use Instagram. So one of the things is, is that our consumers post on Instagram, obviously, and as you can see, this is someone named Esther Trevino, Typical Instagrammer, she's got 90 followers, and Esther, in the bottom center, posted a picture of our chocolate chip cookies. By the way, that's our old packaging, it's gotten better. Um, and, and if we go into it, you can see it's a bigger photo. So we did some research, and one of the questions that we wanted to know is, why do people post photos of packaged product on Instagram? And here's what we found. We have no idea. Right? Why do people do that? It's a box. Who would, who would take a picture of a box? But people do all the time, every single day. And so we love people like Esther because they're sharing this information with other followers. Yes, it's only 90 followers, but they're sharing this information and it costs us absolutely nothing. So on our site, um, one of the things that we did differently is as you can see on these photos, they're kind of artsy. So this is part of our strategy. Just recently, within the last 60, 75 days, we, we actually hired a photographer. We were doing it all on our own. We hired a photographer at a relatively inexpensive rate and said, try and make our products look a little bit more artsy. Um, this is what we used to post on Instagram. Now, here's what's interesting. So this is the picture that we took in a store that just shows our product on display and it has 280 likes. Here's an artsy fartsy picture, and it has 182 likes. Now, we don't know which one's right, and, but what we're doing is we're testing it. We're saying, all right, what do people really wanna see? Do they wanna see fun pictures? Do they wanna see pictures that show where product is available? It's too early to tell, but one of the things that we're willing to do is we're willing to test. So another takeaway. I used to have a slide that said this. Don't worry, be crappy. And what I mean by that is, don't wait to be perfect. Just put it up there. You'll, you can change it tomorrow. And just test it. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's OK. Look around this room. Here's what I'll guarantee you. No one in this room is an expert with social media. It's way too new. So try different things. And that's what we're doing on our Instagram. We also tend to own a position. So in this case, we're using a hashtag, eat freely, and we own that hashtag. Um, and these are all people who are posting different pictures using the hashtag, eat freely. So hashtag strategy is really important to us, as is our mobile Twitter account. So without spending a whole lot of time on, on Twitter, as you can see, um, we tend to post uh, different photos. We will post um, uh, product photos. Sometimes we'll post uh, team photos. And uh, you can see Casey and Carol in there. Uh, Katie was up in Calgary during that photo. So uh, mobile's really important and it helps us build this community. And so our community is we have over 250,000 people who have liked us on Facebook and who are following us. And we consider this all part of the path to purchase. It's connecting with people, whether it's my Twitter account, which has a totally different strategy than our corporate Twitter account. And so the different strategy is on my Twitter account, it is a, um, a window into the company. And on the corporate Twitter account, it's more about the company itself. 
and not my views of the company. And that is a, a, a strategy that we, that we determined. Okay, so where does it leave us before we get into mobile a lot? Um, you can see as we run through the numbers, and as I said, um, these numbers are a few weeks old, but you can see it's, it's a growing social community. Here's the other thing I will share with you. You can't do everything. So you'll notice there's not Google Plus on there. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of social areas. That YouTube is not on there because we've not been good at YouTube yet, so we're missing that. And you can't do it all because if you're sitting in a conference like this, how do you know? Should you be Instagramming? Should you be Vine? Should you be Periscoping? You, you won't be able to pay attention. So just choose what's working for you and then stick with it. I will tell you one that's missing up here that I think, um, you know, we talk about it internally. Uh, Snapchat really concerns me. And those of you who are in the room who are in your late 20s and say, I don't get Snapchat, ha ha. Now you know how I feel, right? <laughs> because this is what's happening. It just keeps changing. And, um, you know, I think Snapchat is potentially one of the next big areas um, for brands. But you never know. Because how many of you know what Secret is? So Secret was like yik yak, and Secret had raised a uh, hundred million dollars and went out of business last week. So not everything that raises money and that gets these crazy valuations is going to succeed, and it's hard to know which ones, and that's why you want to experiment. All right. So what happens with people when they're shopping in mobile? Well, 55% of shoppers we know use their smartphones when they're shopping. Another stat is that 41% of shoppers are asking for mobile ads that are location-based. And one of the things that you're going to see is beacon technology. And beacon technology is when you walk into a store and you're walking down an aisle and your phone beeps because the beacon is sending out a message specific to that aisle or to your profile. So we think technology will continue to grow as people are shopping. And 52% of women use smartphones to share photos of what they purchase. Why? We don't know. But here's the other thing. How many retailers will stop you from taking a photo? Right? You go into a retail store, and if you take a photo, sometimes the SWAT team comes down from the rafters and, and, and confiscates the camera. You want people taking pictures in your stores. So this is our um, mobile site. And those of you uh, most likely know that Google changed their algorithm a couple weeks ago. And if your site is not optimized for mobile, you're going to drop down on the search results. Uh, fortunately, we had changed our mobile site about I don't know, six months ago. And so we're fully optimized for mobile. And you can see that you know, we make it really easy for people to utilize mobile. Um, and one of the things that we're working on is how we add video to mobile. So I want to share a video with you that we just produced. Hi, I'm Kendra Peterson, consulting chef for Enjoy Life Foods. Today I'm going to show you one of our fan favorite recipes. There are plentil crusted chicken tenders. You can use any of your favorite flavors. Today I'm going to use our garlic and parmesan. First what you do is pour your bag of plentils into a food processor. So you just take your chicken, get a little bit of a coating, in your allergy-free mayo, and then just cover it with the crushed lentils, just like you would with breadcrumbs. Pop it on your sheet tray, and then continue with the rest. So they're all coated in their lentil breadcrumbs, and we're just gonna pop them in the oven for about 15 to 18 minutes at 400. Now they're all done, and we're just going to put them in this super cute basket to serve to everybody. Just layer them in there. I love to serve these with either a salad or maybe some fresh carrot sticks that have your favorite dip on the side, because you can use the same dip for the chicken if you'd like. With 
Was that not the cutest basket you've ever seen? <laughs> so, but here's the thing about that. So the, a, couple, a couple things that I want to share with you. That's actually one of the first videos that we've done in, in this series. How many people, and you won't hurt our feelings, how many people think, oh my God, when is this thing going to end? Okay, a little long. Someone asked earlier in one of the other sessions, I think it was to uh, the speaker from Wilton, how long should a video be? That was only an hour, uh, an hour. That was only a minute. That was a minute 47 seconds. But it just goes on forever. Why? Because the attention span of people watching on their phones is going to be really short. So that's one of the things that you want to keep in mind. Now, we, we developed this video to be used in other ways. And we'll show you that in a second. A couple other things I'll share with you about this video. This video costs us $800 to produce. We did it in her kitchen. It's Kendra's kitchen. Um, you can see Kendra didn't dress up. Uh, you know, she's got her, her, chef's, her chef's jacket, and she wore her pair of blue jeans. We had no special lighting. We had one person doing the camera. And this goes back to my don't worry, be crappy. Just throw the video up. It doesn't have to be perfect. Well, it, unless you want a perfect video and then you have to hire a videographer. Everyone know that he, he's got a cheap uh, option as well. So, um, and then learn how you can repurpose the video. So that same video, here's the, the video repurposed for Instagram. So that's 15 seconds, and that's your limit on Instagram. But it's the same video, and all we did was edit it differently. So again, if you're not doing video, and I thought you got some great advice this morning about video, just try it. And try and do it inexpensively, and you can do it on your own. You can have a videographer come in. Um, we think video is really important because it lends to that recipe concept, and we want people to be able to watch those recipes while they're in the aisle. So the other thing that's really important to us is you know, this, this idea of think digitally and act analog. Experiential marketing is really important to us. We like to be out talking to our consumers. So in 2014, we were in 42 states and provinces. And part of what we do when we're out there is we talk face to face to consumers. We're giving them samples so that they can tweet about it or they can post it on their Facebook or on their Instagram. And we saw 135,000 consumers last year where everyone got samples. We give them reasons to post things on their Instagram. Um, so that's our photo booth at some consumer events where we uh, have these thought bubbles. As you can see, we're not shy about branding because it's all about branding. And we want to make sure that our brand is out there. And we make sure that when we're giving everyone a bag and, and people will walk through the halls with our bags, that we have all of our social platforms everywhere, whether it's on the bag or whether it's on the sign that happens to be at our booth, we make sure that people know how they can post on the social platforms. And we give reasons for people to engage. So one of the things that we know is that our bloggers love taking pictures with us. So we invite them. We invite our bloggers to take a picture with us. This is this past weekend in Chicago. Um, bloggers taking pictures with us. Um, that's Keely, our blogger, and this is our, uh, one of our bloggers from Michigan. And um, so I share this with you not because um, I have an ego, but because it'll show you how much they engage. So this is what she posted afterwards. Oh my goodness, fangirl moment, met Joel Wardy from Enjoy Life Foods, swoon. <laughs> this is the only time in my life that I get hashtag swoon. And periodically I will go home and I'll show my wife and she'll say, really? She says, I know the real truth. So, but, but, you know, why, why am I out there and why is our team out there? Because they want to engage with us. And it creates that devotion and it's that whole think digitally but act analog. We know they're going to post it, so we invite them in to take those pictures. And the fact is, is that 92% of all this word of mouth that we, we focus on happens offline, not online. So we're creating all of this engagement so that people share the stories offline. So as we're talking about this digital path to purchase, let me give you some examples. So last year I shared with you that we use Ibotta a lot. We're using Ibotta more than ever. And if you don't have Ibotta on your uh, Android or iPhone, I highly recommend that you download it. Ibotta is, um, 
it's a reward program that pays you rewards in cash. So in essence, it works with major retailers throughout the United States. I'm going to show you an example of one. And what it allows you to do, there's our product. As you can see below our product, it says you can earn 75 cents. And you don't earn a coupon, you actually earn cash that's either put in the form of a check via PayPal or in a gift card. And what do you have to do to earn 75 cents? Well, you have to read a fun fact. Enjoy life food, soft-baked cookies are an allergy-friendly and gluten-free, tasty treat for both kids and adults. Boom, earned a quarter. Or you can fill out a quick poll. On average, how many gluten-free products do you purchase per store visit? And then we get that data. And it costs us less than a dollar as a brand to get this data. And then the other thing is share it, on, uh, share it online and uh, earn another 25 cents. So that's how Ibotta works. Here's what I will tell you about Ibotta for those of you who are CPG brands. It is our number one redemption program that we use out of all of our coupon redemptions. It's amazing how many people engage. By the way, they have to buy the product to get the cash, and they have to take a picture of the receipt, upload the receipt, and buy the product to get 75 cents. Who would work that hard for 75 cents? And the answer is a lot of people. We don't know why, but they do. So Ibotta is really important to us. We use it for a lot of our products at a lot of retailers. But when we're looking at our retailers, so the number one retailer in the world, Walmart, only carries four of our products. But they're really big on this whole concept of endless aisle. So when you go into a Walmart, you may only find four Enjoy Life products, but you'll find the rest of our products on their mobile site and their e-commerce and their e site. And where Walmart is headed is that when you're picking up a box of Enjoy Life cookies and you want other flavors, that you can order it in the aisle and have it delivered to you in two hours. That's where they're headed. So if you're a brand and you're thinking about this path to purchase, you want to be able to, to have this integrated program where you're getting people into the store, but you also have the right content online. Instacart. So a lot of people are using Instacart. This is, a, a, this is a, a screenshot of Instacart, not with Whole Foods, and it's hard, you can't see it up there, but working with Sunset Foods in Highland Park. And what you can't see because it's, it's but I'll, I'll share with you, so there's our two baking chocolate, Enjoy Life chocolate chips, that's our mini chips, and our chocolate chunks, and the price is $6.29 for a 10 ounce bag. This is Vitacost, and Vitacost has the same product for $3.79. Look at the difference, $6.29, $3.79. Instacart will get it to you in a couple hours, Vita cost a couple days. And so you gotta decide. But we're, we're consumer, or excuse me, we're customer agnostic, we support them both, but look at the differential when it comes to pricing. How many people know who Vita cost is? So here's the interesting thing about Vita cost for those of you who aren't aware of it. Um, they're based in Boca Raton, Florida, and the reason that people are worried about Vitacost is Kroger bought them within the last year. And Kroger is the number two supermarket retailer after, after Walmart. Right, so Walmart's got their own e-commerce site, Kroger's got 3,000 plus stores, and now they have Vitacost. And who are they both trying to attack? Amazon. So uh, we look at Vitacost. Vitacost is a really important partner of ours, and we do a lot with Vitacost. They're really inexpensive. And as you can see, reviews are really important on Vitacost as well. We're going to whip through some of these. Um, because our products are non-GMO verified, we do um, specific uh, sites like the Non-GMO Project, where you can search our brand. And then we find that there's a lot of nutrition sites out there, which is all part of our path to purchase. So this is a site called ShopWell, where you can shop by uh, category. And as you can see, our products are there. If you see the red buttons and the yellow buttons, the red means this product isn't right for you because it's reading my profile. And why isn't it right? Well, here's our Enjoy Life Snickerdoodles, and I've given up sugar and our products do have sugar in them. So it's telling us, yeah, it's whole grain, it's low saturated fat, it's low sodium, but there's added sugar. Doesn't mean the product's bad, but people are using sites like this. And so as Enjoy Life, what we look at is, all right, how do we optimize a site like Shopwell or a site like Find Me Gluten Free? So we're, again, we're just trying to give you some examples. In a, in a site like Find Me Gluten Free, 
where it's not about products, it's about restaurants, we advertise on the mobile site. So we're looking at each different mobile platform as a different strategy. We don't look at mobile as a strategy on its own. Each site has a different strategy. And then when it comes to transparency, something like in your food, in our food, so you can pick by allergen, it'll find the product. But here's what's interesting about this. So this is one of the challenges that we have and one of the challenges that you'll have. You, you won't know this, but we know this, and Casey will yell at me afterwards about this. So this packaging is old. This isn't our current packaging. And in fact, these two products, these bagels, we haven't made them for seven years. But this site launched this year. So we don't know where they're pulling their information from. And so one of the challenges when you have this mobile path to purchase strategy is staying on top of the content. You can't just load it up and hope and pray it's going to be right. You have to assume it's going to be wrong. And so we see that all the time with, with sites like this. Um, and then we try and pick the best because there's a lot of apps that are being built. So this is one that's called Ingredient One, which is out of New York. We really like Ingredient One. But look at all the apps that are talking about food allergies. I mean, they can't all be successful. So what we do is we hedge our bet and we work with as many as we can without taking up too much of our time. So let us talk about our site for a sec second. The where to buy part of our mobile site is really important because I want to show you exactly how we, we do this. So with our site, you can choose by product to find out where it's located. So in this case, I checked the box Snickerdoodle. And I was doing this from home last night uh, or a couple nights ago uh, in Evanston. And so it said I could find Snickerdoodle a mile away at the Jewel Osco and Whole Foods 1.6 miles. And because in Evanston we have two Whole Foods, about to have three, um, it, tells, it tells me exactly where, where the product is. By product, so not by brand. And we think that is part of a game changer, is that we're able to help our consumer find our product and drive the, pro the consumer to the store, not their store. Because we don't really care where they go. Um, and so in this case, I said, OK, I'm going to go to the Jewel. It's closest. It's a mile away. And um, what else do they have? There's all the other available products that they have. And here's my directions to get to that store. So this is all built into our mobile site. And then finally, what I'll share with you is that new partners, this is something called Abe's Market. And uh, the only reason I show you this, here's our, our crunchy lentil chips, which are garlic and Parmesan, but they're dairy flavored, but they're dairy free. And here's what it says about this product. Need more cheese in your life? This is the chip for you, which tells us the content is wrong because we don't use cheese. So this is the challenge, remember, we don't own our brand. They own our brand. And they're writing whatever they want to write. And our job with a three and a half person marketing team is how do you figure all this out and stay on top of it? So how has this and uh, Amazon, we, you know, we all know that Amazon is uh, big on, on reviews. So how has all this worked for Enjoy Life? In 2012, we grew by 41%. So after we created that consumer-centric strategy, we had a great success. 2013, we came back with a 40% growth after the 41% growth. And then in 2014, another 41% growth. So we had year after year, three years in a row, a 40% plus growth. And then, not that it was planned, but because we were doing things that other CPG companies looked at and said, how are they doing this? And we were in this whole better for you area, in a food allergy area that people didn't know existed. Two months ago, Mondelez, the people that make Oreos and Nutter Butter and Wheat Thins, acquired us. Now, for those of you who are Enjoy Life consumers, you may have heard this and people freaked out, right? Uh, because it was like the evil empire. Anyone here from Mondelez? Okay, so it was like the evil empire buying us, right? <laughs> um, but here's the reality. What we, saw, what we saw this is an opportunity to create a revolution from within. Because all of our products are verified non-GMO and they're staying verified non-GMO. And all of our products use no artificial ingredients and they're staying that way. So we could stand on the outside and point fingers at the big companies of the world and say you're doing it wrong, 
or we can become part of the solution and help them see how to do it right. And to Mondelez's credit, what Mondelez said was, whatever you do, if someone from Mondelez calls you up to tell you what you should do, hang up the phone. Don't listen. So we're operating as a standalone company. Um, we're still in Joy Life employees. We're all still there. And uh, we're hoping that we can change um, the way uh, a company like Mondelez does business. So that's what we're doing at Enjoy Life. I want to share for the last few minutes, I do want to share, I want to make you a little bit uncomfortable. I want to share with you what you should worry about. So anyone here from Gillette, which is now owned by Procter & Gamble? No? OK. So this is typical razor blade, right? This is the Gillette uh, sensor on a Fusion Pro Glide, five and a half star, whatever this thing is. And when razor blades are sold, this is the way they're sold, right? You get a, a display in a store and you hope and pray that someone who walks by this will buy this product. But there's disruptors all around us. So this company came out called Dollar Shave Club. And Dollar Shave Club is a disruptor. So let's see what Dollar Shave Club had to say. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandra, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu-jitsu, I drive like a gay, so when I'm coming to see you, see so, so if you notice the tagline, shave time, shave money, so it's about saving money and it's about getting your blades within two days when you need it. And not surprising, um, they have a mobile site. So they're a disruptor. They're a lot less expensive than Gillette. And you don't have to go to the store because it's a staple item. It's going to ship to you. But the world's changing really fast. By the way, $35,000 investment, a YouTube video that he shot with his roommate, that one video, they're doing $7.3 million per month. Wow. Per month. That's Dollar Shave Club. But if I'm Dollar Shave Club, I'm worried about Harry's. Because Harry's came out, and they offer faster turnaround and less expensive blades. So they're disrupting the retailer. And if you think about path to purchase, totally changing the way we go path to purchase because it's now coming to your house. So who should Harry and Dollar Shave, come worry, Dollar Shave Club worry about? I'd worry about this solution. Thirty-minute delivery. So it's going to be 30-minute delivery. If I need a shave and I don't have any blades, I can go on my Amazon Prime account, and it will be delivered to my office or my house within 30 minutes, guaranteed. How many people think this will never happen? How many people want to bet? 
It's going to happen. Because all you got to do is pick it up and, it, and it's easy. It's not going to happen with groceries because groceries are heavy. But it's going to happen with certain items. And who should Amazon be afraid of? 4 a.m. That's when it all gets started. And there are no shortcuts along the way. Because nothing good ever came easy. Or fast. Until now. Uber Eats. From tap to table in minutes. So for those of you who are sitting here who use Uber, um, don't do it right now because we have a couple more slides, but if you look on your Uber uh, app today, you'll see Uber Eats is added because you are in the range. You can get a meal delivered to you in 10 minutes. And why should Amazon and Gillette and Harry's and Dollar Shave Club worry about it? Because this is Uber Essentials. Razor blades in 10 minutes. Not in 30, and not delivered two days, and not that you have to go to the store, they'll bring it to you. And so if you look two nights ago, when I was sitting at home, if I needed a shave, there were five delivery people willing to deliver razor blades to me in 10 minutes. That freaks me out about Path to Purchase because it's totally changing the way people are gonna consume brands. And if you're not reaching them through social with all these positive reviews, you're never gonna reach them in the store. So one of the last things I'll leave you with is stop thinking like a marketer or an advertiser and start thinking like a publisher and a socializer because the way that we connect with people is changing. It's not in computer rooms and iPhones and it's not in tablets. It might be in wearables like uh, Google Glass or our uh, Apple Watch. But as Advertising Age said, social and digital, it's not just another channel, but it's totally transforming the way that we as marketers are bringing our brands to market. And so if anything, I'm hoping that you'll walk away from here with some thinking going on. It's like, how do we plan for the future with our brands? Thank you very much. I thought it was okay since we sponsored it. <laughs> it's our food. Um, one comment first. Uh, I think you're right about Snapchat. There was an article in the New York Times this week about Snapchat doing. Um, the election, um, a whole program on elections with partners, so it's, it's going to change things too. Um, my question is, you said one screen. Do you include the television in that? Um, we do. Um, I mean, there are certainly people who are using the television. I think um, mass marketing on television is crazy uh, because it's, I mean, unless you're someone who's got a product that absolutely everyone can use. I used to own a toothbrush company. Mass marketing is perfect for that because everyone brushes their teeth, hopefully. Um, and on the last day that you live, you're going to brush your teeth because you don't know that's the last day you're going to live. So um, that lends itself to TV, but I think traditional TV, um, it's going to go away. Things like Apple TV, et cetera, will, will take over. But we do consider it one screen. And I want to go back to one thing you said about Snapchat, and that is one thing I learned in the last week, and we're going to look at do we need to change, is Snapchat finds that if your video is vertical versus horizontal, you have a five-time chance of people finishing the video. That's just interesting. So, um, and if you remember our cooking video, it's horizontal. So now we have to look at do we shoot it vertical? Um, it's a little thing. Why? We don't know, but it's just true. Thank you.